Welcome everyone, we'll give another minute or so. Let people join. All right, well, maybe we should just get started. That's all right with everyone. Yeah. Awesome. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending where you are in the world. Uh, my name is Mark Zemble. I'm Chief Marketing Officer at CloudBolt Software. Uh, CloudBolt is a company that helps, uh, helps our customers to be able to optimize, automate, and better control their, their cloud environments. And more specifically to FinOps, we really help to, to gain more control over your cloud financial management. And then additionally add on um, automation and orchestration that further helps once things are optimized to keep things optimized. So with that said, uh, welcome everyone to our discussion today on the real state of FinOps and that research. Um, I'm really excited today to be joined by um, Paul Bragan. He's a senior partner at Wakefield Research. Uh, Wakefield is a well-known and highly respected research firm out of the DC area. Uh, we retain them to conduct the research for us for this global study. And Paul, I've asked him to add additional layers of context around the data, deeper slices as, as we go through this, and also to really set up about the methodology and get deep on uh, how we constructed the, the study and who was involved and, and the statistical validity of the, of the study, just covering that up front. And then I'm also joined by Kyle Campos, uh, who is a Chief Technology Officer here at CloudBolt, and Will Norton, who is Senior Product Marketing uh, Manager, as well as um, the Head of Go-To-Market uh, for our function here at CloudBolt. Uh, both Kyle and Will have deep roots in FinOps, both here and in former roles, uh, have a particular passion for it. And interestingly, they just, they just got back from uh, FinOps X, uh, the conference by the FinOps Foundation out in San Diego. So I think we're gonna ask them to also provide some of those fresh insights from that, that uh, conference in relation to this, this research and also some of the happenings that, that occurred there. So without further ado, uh, let's jump into the research. Um, just setting up uh, some context about the research, this is all part of a, 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 a series that we have called CloudBolt Industry Insights. Um, we're, we've been doing it about two years now. We originally started and I said, you know, I looked across the market and said, there's large omnibus studies on a lot of different topics that go very thin across a wide area. But there's certain truths that are right below the surface, certain insights that we think are there if we would just dig in a little bit further. So we wanted Cloudbolt Industry Insights to be something that was a little bit more timely, uh, whether it's two, two, three, four times a year instead of just one, and digging into particular topics to, to get to those truths underneath the, 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 the surface layer. And so in all of them, if you haven't read any of the Cloudbolt Industry Insight research, I would highly suggest you go to um, our resource center on cloudbolt.io. Uh, they're all there and they all have really interesting tidbits. There's always great nuggets in there that help your thinking um, and help shape the conversation around cloud. And in this particular case, we're talking about uh, the state of FinOps. There were a lot of studies that were the, the state of FinOps. Uh, we call this one the real state of FinOps because again, we're, we're digging for those truths and I think we found some really interesting ones here. So with that, I'll turn over to Paul and we can discuss uh, some of the, the methodology for we can just get that out of the way up front. Welcome, Paul. Glad you're here. Thanks, Mark. So um, before we get into the research results and the findings, um, I think it's helpful to discuss sort of what, what we did, the mechanics and the methodology of, of the survey that we conducted with CloudBolt. So the results that we're going to take you through are based on a quantitative survey of 500 total respondents. Uh, we surveyed people across uh, the US and Canada, the UK, 
in Australia. And that 500 uh, sample size, I, call, I wanted to call that out because what we're gonna be looking at here today are uh, statistically significant uh, decision grade results from a robust quantitative sampling. Uh, uh, respondents were a mix of executives and engineers and developers, 50-50. Uh, and we did that so that we could look at issues really from, from both sides of the coin, if you will. So we have uh, the leadership perspective from executives, and then we have that sort of uh, a practitioner perspective, if you will, so that we can see how developers and engineers felt about a particular idea or a question or an issue. All of these are large organizations. So all of these uh, participants are people who are working in FinOps, influencing, making decisions about FinOps, at large organizations defined as companies with 5,000 or more employees. But we actually segmented the results that we can look at particularly large organizations, so over 7,000 employees, and then those with 5,000 to 7,000 employees. Fantastic. Thank you for, for covering that. And again, if you haven't read the research, there's a link for it right here. Be sure to, to check that out and, and, and leverage it however you'd like to. Um, I'll go in now and just talk about some of the, the, the reasons for the research, how we arrived at wanting to do this study. Um, as we got to the beginning of 2023 and, and Will and I were thinking about, well, what's the next one we want to do? Um, obviously, FinOps was, was on our, our radar for, for some time. We knew we would do one. Um, but we looked at this and we said, this macro market, is, is the, the spending is, is a little bit out of control. There's, there's a lot of sprawl. Uh, we're hearing for the first time at that time, you know, in the view of what's happening with the recession, what's happening with inflation, um, companies starting to pull back a little bit. And in fact, there was a, a one piece of research that said about 81% of leaders were being asked to hold their cloud spend level or even reduce it for the first time, which was kind of unheard of. Um, at that same time, while that's coming down, FinOps Foundation and that, that community is going up and reaching that critical mass. You see it happening. You see the excitement building there. Um, and as we looked at the other studies, we said, no one's, we haven't really seen something that got at evaluating what's really happening. What's the results from FinOps so far? How are people feeling about the progress that they're making? Is it working yet? Or what's the time horizons for when it will work? And so some of those questions kind of hints at what we were trying to, 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 to figure out, but we really wanted to let the data tell the story. There wasn't really a preconceived notion. It's like, let's get this out there and let's let the data tell the story of where we are. And where the data led us was a, two different tales. The first tale is a tale of fantastic progress for FinOps, really amazing progress. I think Craig Hinckley, our CEO, said there's very few examples in, in modern history where there's been a community or a movement or a practice that has moved so quickly and had such broad and, and massive adoption. So I think that's very true. And I think this, this study really starts to point that out. And so this idea of FinOps ubiquity, Right, it's, it's reached a point of ubiquity. And we found that in the study because 82% of companies now have a formal team, FinOps team in place. They're not just saying we're gonna adopt FinOps, they're saying we're putting a formal team in place, or they have, that's 82% have. There's an additional 16% who said, we're not there yet, but we're going to. We are all in to make this happen in the near future. Combined, 98% of this global survey of 500 people said, we have a FinOps team in place, which is a massive number. Um, Paul, as you looked at those numbers surrounding that question, um, were there other slices of that data that you found interesting relative to the ubiquity? Yeah, this, uh, thanks, Mark. This, this 82% is obviously, uh, it's an average across everybody that we, that we surveyed. It's even stronger if we focus on the largest organizations, so over 7,000 employees. They're more than nine in 10, so 91%. Uh, of organizations actually had a FinOps team in place. And, and you touched on this earlier, which is that that 18%, the other, uh, the other organizations that don't have a formal FinOps in place, the overwhelming majority, 89% of them are considering adding one. So uh, really strong. Fantastic. And, and Kyle, Kyle, just want to do a quick reality check with you. Over the course of your career, have you ever seen adoption like this of something like a FinOps? Is there another analog to this where it's, it's moved that quickly, that fast, with such broad adoption, 98% globally? I think um, 
I think there's been there's a lot of parallels with other with even at FinOpsX. I was struck by this how much parallels there are to sort of the DevOps movement uh, and that how that entered the enterprises. But I think that was on a much slower trajectory because uh, the the problems it was solving were not as vertically visible in the organization as cloud spend is. Right. So I mean that's like this is a little bit more top down pain uh that a community has organized around to to solve which i think has accelerated uh you know the the popularity of it the awareness of it but then also the, the need for it so i i think the way the conversation is happening now is very similar but to your point i think the pace of acceleration is is a lot higher and that's because this has a lot more top down uh need than like devops which is much more bottom up yeah, that, that's that's great. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so ubiquity uh, is established. You, you know, it's it's reset point of ubiquity. Um, from there, it's also FinOps has then also become prioritized within organizations. Um, three quick data points: the average size of the FinOps team. It's not just hey, there's a person. Hey, the, the person is taking care of FinOps. The team, on average, is four point one people, which is significant. Um, 71% of companies are saying that their funding actually increased in this environment where people are pulling back because of a recession, because of uncertainty, because of what's happening in the market, funding increased for FinOps. And to, to Cal's point, probably because it is a top-down initiative and they see it as directly tying into uh, cost and waste and, and optimization. Um, and then 58% of the organizations report that they are having to report their metrics on FinOps to either the C-suite or even the board of directors, which is fascinating as well, that it's getting that kind of visibility within an organization. That's how much it's prioritized. So Paul, I think you saw this to be especially true amongst larger enterprises again and, and how they've embraced FinOps. And, and you talked about um, them walking the walk when we talked about this previously. Maybe you can talk about that. Yeah, they're they're not just uh, they're not just talking the talk. They're they're actually walking the walk. These larger organizations, uh, so seven thousand uh, employees or more, over seven thousand, I should say. Um, they're really they're leading the charge. So more than than three and four uh, of those companies, seventy six percent are likely to have actually expanded funding for uh, for FinOps resources this year in twenty twenty three. Um, like like the stat shows. Overall, a majority of organizations are increasing their spending, they're prioritizing this, um, but those larger, more established companies, they're really leading the charge. Fantastic. So with that said, we've established now that there's ubiquity, it's become prioritized, and the third leg of that stool is really that it's become viewed as being essential within the organizations. So 74% now that say that FinOps has an equal seat at the table as very established operations groups within traditional enterprises, IT ops, DevOps, SecOps, 74% say equal seat at the table, which is amazing that that happened that quickly. Um, additionally, 71% now indicate that in 2023, it'll be significantly challenging to achieve their IT goals without FinOps. And then on top of that, 89%, almost nine of 10 are now agreeing that FinOps is the silver bullet for how they're going to solve their cost management issues. So uh, again, it's just the fate of completed. Now FinOps is seen as the way that people are going to solve for cloud cost problems. Um, were there similar responses here between executives and frontline engineers, Paul, or, or were there additional disparities on any of these? So here is where we saw a lot of consensus. Um, we saw extreme consensus, actually. So that's seventy-one percent um, that indicate that uh, achieving IT goals without FinOps would be a significant challenge. That's actually seventy-one percent of executives, seventy-one percent of leadership, and seventy-one percent of engineers and developers. Uh, so the this view that it's essential, uh, it's it's seen. Uh, it's seen from the top down and the bottom up. And, and Will, just if you're thinking back to FinOps X, um, did you get that sense there that there was that unanimity of uh, this idea that FinOps is the answer to the cloud cost problem? That is the methodology that's going to provide the answer. What was the, the feeling there? 
Yeah, I would say that was loud and clear with with everyone we spoke to. And I think probably the the, the biggest you know data point I could give is just in the the range of different roles that we met with. You know, you kind of expect when you go to a conference like that, that is focused on maybe one domain, if you will, that you're just having those practitioners involved in the discussion and showing up. You know, Kyle can speak to this as well. We spoke with a bunch of different personas in the business. There were CFOs there, there were VPs of IT, there were cloud infrastructure, there was DevOps team members, a ton of FinOps practitioners, obviously, but in, in a niche we can call it a niche conference that's focused on one domain to have that many folks, you know, taking their time to come out and learn about this. I think that speaks volumes to if people believe in this, this domain as being the resolution for some of these problems. I also think there's something to be said here about the fact that it's not, you know, FinOps is not dethroning another function in the business. There wasn't anything necessarily to replace. And so this is the first iteration. It is the first truth, if you will. Uh, whereas, you know, some of the other operational things like DevOps were kind of tearing down old processes and rethinking old ways of doing things. FinOps is solving a new challenge. So it's it's really the only, it's the only kind of guidebook or, or approach or framework that we have. So lots of great enthusiasm at the conference, a lot of enthusiasm coming through in this research. Um, but this was kind of that point where uh, things shifted a little bit. And as I wrote in the, the report, if we simply stopped here at this juncture and we didn't dig any deeper, you'd probably think that everything FinOps related was either rainbows or unicorns, you know, <laughs> it, was, it was a love fest. Um, but this is kind of that point where the truth started to emerge and you know, it pointed to a story, the second side of the story, which is a tale of a promise yet unfulfilled. And so, Paul, before I really jump into those particular results, I'm, I'm just curious with you, just from my own knowledge, as, you, as you've done research like this in the past, um, is it typical in, in many of those studies that you get to a point and there's a pivot like that, where it's like one line and everything's all very positive, and then all of a sudden there's this, this other, oh, the rest of the story type of, of moment in that research? Uh, it is, in fact, uh, well, I should say the pivot that we saw here is really unique to the study. So usually in a study like this, when we're looking at executives and practitioners, we tend to see more divergence and sort of divergence of opinions throughout because uh, of people who are really thinking tactically uh, versus those who are thinking at, at 30,000 feet. Um, and so what was unique, I think, with this survey was how we saw a lot of consensus up front. But then when we started thinking about bringing things to life, the, the pivot in the, the dramatic nature of that pivot, which you're going to see when we get into some of these results, was really unique to this study. Awesome. Well, with that as a background, let's jump into the first one here. And it has to do with uh, FinOps maturity. So I think at FinOps X, there was probably a lot of talk about all the whiz-bang new advanced stuff that, 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 that can happen. And Will, I'm going to get to some questions about that in a second, but what the data told us was that the engineers, developers, the people on the front line, if you ask them what's their top priority, 46% um, of them said cost, cost, visibility and reporting. Some of the most basic uh, things that, that, are, that people were trying to solve are still issues. Um, there was a divergence, I believe, with, with executives. That was their least uh, noted priority because I think they already saw, thought that they had it solved and they're looking down the road at the more shiny objects. But when you got to brass tacks of who's doing the work, these basic problems still emerge. And I think Kyle, you and I talked about at FinOps X that, that this notion of tagging even still came up a lot um, as an issue in many of the sessions. So maybe you can elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah, there's this um, interesting duality where you'd hear you know, main stage talks, things like that, that are, are kind of the leading edge of cap capabilities and expectations and, you know, kind of exciting the room. Lots of, lots, lots of, uh, you know, new catchphrases trying to kind of take over like full stack FinOps and, you know, adopting DevOps language, like shifting left, you know, uh, FinOps uh, capabilities, um, you know, in some of the breakout 
rooms there was uh or talks there was you know examples of uh companies even even smaller companies that have developed custom maturity scoring systems for all their teams to grade them on their FinOps capabilities. So people have really, you know, pushed on the leading edge. If we, um, this this is reminding me of uh, similar for like Dora research for DevOps maturity and high performing, low performing teams, you know, you could start to see the leading edge, higher performers start to peak, uh, you know, poke their heads out a little bit uh, in the clouds. And then, but at the same time, everyone is still, Every talk had uh, bullet points around tagging is so difficult, and here's how here's how we've approached that. Right, everybody had a bespoke path for that. Uh, everybody had a, a, a you know a, some angst bullet points around how do we motivate engineers to actually do something. Right, um, uh, one one uh, company even. Uh, identified their finance team as efficiency engineers, which I was like, oh boy, that I know, I know how poorly that'll go down in, in, in a uh, DevOps space. Like, clearly you're the inefficient engineers. Um, cost visibility and reporting, as you can say, like somebody, some, what, what we would think would be that all the sort of foundational capabilities um, clearly are still uh, A, both sort of uh, in a bespoke way the solution paths to it are bespoke uh, and and there's still a lot of struggle there. Well, were there any things that, that you heard in your conversations that, you know, dealing with the bleeding edge of, of what's next that, you know, we should be thinking about beyond the basics? Well, of course, as you know, practitioners, we, we can all be very excited about what's next and looking down the line, the technology, certainly a lot of AI, ML, automation, uh, focus and discussion, because that's the fun stuff, right? I mean, it, you know, for lack of a better term, it's the sexy stuff. But I, I think at the end of the day, you know, coming back to the, as Kyle put it, the foundational components, organizations are, are just kind of going to have to to come to terms with the fact that there's a lot of technical debt that needs to be sorted out and fixed initially, and then maintained on an ongoing basis to get what most end users need, we'll call them the engineers in this instance, which is essentially just line of sight to what they're spending. And that can be very tricky because as Kyle said in a conversation we had at, at FinOpsX, you know, it's kind of like Tetris, right? You can remove rows and that's great, but the second that a piece goes down the wrong way, it undoes all the work that you've done. And so, this cost visibility and reporting and tagging those foundational things will always be a set of challenges that practitioners are going to have to constantly solve for. And if I'm at the leadership level, I'm probably going, we were talking about this three years ago. I thought we bought a tool, right? I thought we, I thought we sorted this out. I thought we fixed it. But you know, just like in the world of security, it's constant maintenance. It's constant you know, fixing it and making sure and reevaluating and assessing. Um, and there's ways to mature that a lot quicker. But Certainly on the ground floor, we heard a lot of these are still challenges for us. I love the Tetris analogy. That was great. Um, yeah. Very <laughs> um, so, so given this duality you both talked about, it's, it's obvious that, you know, they're still struggling with basics. So what's another red flag that we should be gleaning from this research? And I think it has to do with, you know, one of the key tenets of the FinOps practice is that it takes a village. It takes everyone who's touching the cloud to be responsible for the, the cost containment and, and FinOps. Um, but what we saw in the research was actually that only 9% of people actually saw it that way, which was fascinating. Um, everybody's bought in on FinOps, but only 9% say that it is the, the responsibility of everyone involved. In the vast majority of cases, they said it was either an individual or a team. So Paul, is there more that you can tell us about that gap? Yeah, we well, we this theme here, we saw it come up a few times uh, in the data, in the research. So uh, I'll talk about another data point that I think gives kind of color and perspective about why they're feeling this way. So um, most executives and actually most developers and engineers, they, they view FinOps core principles today as really as helpful guidelines. Uh, and that's as opposed to something that is critically important to follow. Uh, in fact, depending on how you want to look at the numbers, 
they're only half as likely today to, to see FinOps principles as, as critically important or you know, the, the other side, you could flip that and say that they're, they're twice as likely to be thinking about these things as, as helpful guidelines. And so that gives you some context into color and color into how they're thinking about it um, and why they probably don't yet feel that this is mission critical and something that everybody on the team needs to be involved in and that more people are on the team than, you know, than you may actually think. Um, they're, like I said, they're still sort of at that, uh, thinking about these things as guidelines um, as opposed to uh, critical tenets. Hey, well, why, why does the FinOps Foundation make such a, a big deal about it taking a village to take responsibility for the cloud costs? And, and what are the dangers if people don't do that? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the analogy I always like to give is, is looking back at just regular travel policies uh, or credit card policies that most enterprises have, right? If you would ask the CFO who's responsible for protecting our assets as a company, the CFO would say it's everybody in the business, right? It's anybody who can introduce costs to our business needs to you know, be very focused on, on you know, understanding their cost and, and managing it. So, uh, you know, my, my reporting hierarchy checks the expenses that I spend and, and make sure that I'm following the policies uh, for you know, TNA, if you will, that are, are put down. In the same way, if you have the ability in the business to introduce new clouds to the, uh, sorry, cost of the cloud, you should have the ability to report on that and to manage it and follow these, these policies. And if one person or one team or one business unit, one cost center doesn't follow that, the introduction of new cost meters, and when I say meters, I, I emphasize that because it's ongoing cost, can scale to create larger problems. And so while there is a central body who's focusing on the strategy and the organizational adoption of these, these practices at large, it does take everybody in the entire organization that has the ability to introduce new cost to manage those costs. Because ultimately, you take that average of about four folks on a team, they can't manage a seven to 10,000 person organization's worth of, of cloud spend by themselves. That's just, that, that is just an impossible task. Um, and so this one was very surprising because if you think about the community that is FinOps, most practitioners know it's a core tenant of the framework. Everybody has to be focused on their cloud spend. And you kind of see some of the issues that we, we have in the past slide, it was, hey, you know, I don't even have visibility or still a challenge for me. How can I manage it if I don't know what I'm spending? So yeah, this was a very interesting one, but I would say, you know, just akin to that, that TNA policy of, that we're all used to, it's, this, it's the same exact construct. Well, I think that, you know, that this, the first time we saw this as, as a group and we looked at that data point, we all kind of raised our eyebrows like, what? <laughs> for the very reasons you described. Um, I think Paul hinted at some of the, the more controversial stuff, uh, the controversial territory of the, the report we're, we're going to get into um, with this next one. And that is around that there are skeptics and people are viewing this in different ways. So it's great that 54% uh, overall say that, you know, it's a critical necessity or it's a transformational process. Those are what you would expect. But then there's this other subsegment of 45% that it ranges from you know, 15% saying, well, it's easy in theory, harder in practice to, well, it's much ado about nothing or eh, it's nothing more than a suggested framework as, as Paul talked about, or even it's a necessary evil at 7%, which was fascinating. And uh, Kyle, I think in particular, you especially want to meet those people who chose to be able just to have a conversation with them. I want to, I want an after hours podcast with just that crew to see <laughs> that's a that's a dark view, dim view of the world. I definitely <laughs> I would love to have uh, that discussion over drinks. <laughs> when you see but but when you see this in its totality here, uh, how does this all sit with you when, when you look at these responses? Um I agree with a lot of them. Um I you know I don't I don't know that they there, in many ways, they complement each other. Um, it is a transformative process, depending on whose theory of FinOps you're talking uh, about. You know, you'd have fragmented views, but certainly everything is harder in practice. Um, and knowing the sort of organizational, you know, pathology that exists in enterprises, the much to do about nothing and 
uh, you know, necessary evil. I can very easily see that being the real experience of people uh, in, in an enterprise on how the practice has been introduced uh, or, you know, mandated um, in, in poor ways, um, uh, low empathy for, you know, engineers who, you know, are, are now being told you got to control the spending. Like I thought, I thought our, you know, this new capability or this new product was the most important thing, but now I got to go this, you know, so it can generate a lot of internal frustration, which I think it is, uh, is seen here. Um, go ahead. Well, yeah, I was going to ask you, Bill, I think when you, when we first talked about it, you said, that well, doesn't surprise me. So why, why did that take? Yeah, it is exactly right. I was going to jump and say, I think this was one of those ones that did not surprise me at all. You've got this new, construct that has risen very quickly and become very popular. And if you're not focusing on this as your day job, there's going to be mixed opinions about what it is, how effective it can be. And ultimately that just, I imagine is, is pretty, uh, pretty normal for where FinOps is in its journey. What I think is more telling is if you are a practitioner or an IT leader, and you're, you know, you're saying, hey, this is a critical necessity. This is something we need to get right because you understand the pain at the large level. The results here, you know, this is what you have to grapple with. I almost look at this result as being one of those things that goes, okay, how do we take these opinions and start to transform them into the opinions that we need to find success across the business? And so while not surprising, I think it underscores the challenge for those folks that are now tasked with making this work at scale, you got to change the hearts and minds and really the culture of your, your organization to get folks on board. Um, and that's, you know, harder in theory and practice than, you know, anything else. So yeah, not surprising, certainly underscores a pretty big uh, mountain to climb. Yeah, I think that's a great point. It really gets at the belief systems within an organization. We, we'll touch on that on the next the next data point. But uh, before we go there, Paul, any other observations that to this set of data, or um, have we beaten this one to death? And we'll go on. Uh, the one thing I would add here is that um, these opinions and these these sentiments. Uh, it's not the case that uh, practitioners, that engineers and developers are, are, are driving and pushing one point of view and executives and leadership are driving the other. So these numbers were more consistent than we would have thought. Pretty, pretty consistent oftentimes within margin of error when we looked at the results between leadership and between engineers and developers. So, um, uh, you know, the, the, these are, uh, Mount, these are mountains, if you will, that you'll have to climb or, or challenges that you'll face with, with both audiences. Awesome, thank you for that. Um, I'm pretty sure you're all gonna have some pretty strong uh, opinions on, and perspectives on the next one. It was the second most controversial data point that we had, uh, and it had to do with speed to impact. And honestly, this, this truly surprised all of us. Um, when asked the question, and I'm going to be real particular on this one. I'm going to actually read the question. It says, in how many years does your company expect it will take before FinOps has a positive material effect on cloud operations and the business? So positive material effect. How long is that going to take? Well, the, the possible answers were four more years, two to three years, one year, less than one year. There was even an answer that said, FinOps has already had a positive material effect on my company. But the vast majority, 76%, believe it's going to take 24 to 36 months before they get to that positive outcome, that positive material effect on their business. And that was just kind of staggering to, to, to all of us, especially people who had you know, been involved in FinOps. Um, it, it, was, it was kind of shocking. So, so Paul, first of all, I believe you said this was one of those questions where there was, again, this kind of notable, noticeable discrepancy between executives and operators. Yeah, definitely. There's, there's a difference here. There's a gap here between uh, the boots on the ground, if you will, and, and those sitting in the boardroom. Uh, and it's, as you would expect, executives are, are pushing to see results uh, as, as quickly as possible. I would say are hoping and expecting to see those material impacts 
as quickly as possible. And engineers and developers are, are the ones that are most likely to say it's going to it's going to take time to bring this to life. Uh, to get specifically into the data, it was actually 83% of engineers and developers who said it's going to take that 24 to 30, 36 months, so two to three years, if you will, to see a, a, a measured positive material impact compared to just 68% of executives. So you see a little bit of a push pull there. You think uh, there's certainly more, I don't know if I would call it optimistic, but there's a, there's a strong push with executive leadership uh, to see results as quickly as possible, to hope to see results and expect to see results as quickly as possible. Um, those engineers and developers, the ones who are, are really doing the day-to-day -day work are far more likely to say it's, it's gonna take time. Another piece of data within this study that, that ties to this was that I think it was 54% of companies who said they had a FinOps practice said that it had only been in, in operation for less than 12 months. So perhaps there's something around the nascency of the group. Perhaps they're wanting to buy a little runway or uh, under promise over deliver. That could have some effect. Will, what do you, how do you see it? What do you think? I was actually a bit surprised at 76% because I think you correlate that with how many organizations said they've had a practice for a while. There's definitely some overlap in, you know, even some of those organizations that are a few years into their uh, timeline here still expecting, you know, 24 to 36 months it means there's a kind of a, a long journey. Uh, Two thoughts, and you know, I can't, I can't uh, specifically nail down why folks are, are are thinking this way. But you know, my theories at this point is that we're still learning so much so quickly that people are taking the long game. They're investing now. They're really putting it and formalizing it, putting it into practice, and they don't want to be too bullish about getting returns very quickly. Uh, and they and they don't want this to seem like another project because you know in my past life when I was doing FinOps consulting, for the longest time it was kind of a one-time project. And now, as leaders and organizations are coming around to the fact that this has to be operational, it cannot just be a one-time exercise. You know, this points to that, right? Which is you know two to three years. This is a long game for us. That's the first thing. The second thing is is that a lot of organizations have run into the same wall multiple times. And it's uh, unfortunately in the world of, of FinOps, you know, you can make traction today and then very quickly tear it back down, going back to that Tetris analogy. And so, so many companies have been burned by trying to do something and it gets unraveled so quickly and you end up into the same problem. And so because of the, the, the past burns and the scars, I think a lot of, a lot of you know, people who have been through this multiple times are going, I can't really be overly confident that it's going to work this time, right? We're going to try something new. We're going to establish a practice. We're going to put people in role. We're going to bring it up higher in the business. But this problem set has been around for five, six years, and we've yet to figure it out fully. So we don't want to be super bullish. It doesn't surprise me that leaders want this to move a lot quicker. It doesn't surprise me that practitioners or the folks on the ground, the end users, the engineers are saying there's a lot more to that than the leaders might be thinking, right? Um, you know, don't distill a whole bunch of problems that need to be solved into one very easy path. So yeah, that's just some of my thoughts on it. You know, Kyle, I know we spoke a little bit about this and, and you had some thoughts as well, uh, but certainly yeah. that's what I've heard at, at FinOpsX as well. Yeah, it's interesting. This is the first time uh, I've I've heard this is real live reaction, folks. But this is the first time I've heard that breakdown of which side thought it would take longer versus the other. And it, what's interesting to me is that's almost the inverse um, uh, data points you would have seen in like digital transformation efforts, which were like executives been like, oh, we got a ten year plan here to really turn this around, and then engineers on the ground. Uh, like me, who had to lead those efforts in, in large enterprises. I was like, I, 10 years, I don't even know if I'll be alive in 10 years, much less working here in 10 years. Like, that's insane. What are we doing this year? So that's interesting that in this case, it's it's more, more the other way around. 
yeah, it, it, the whole thing is fascinating. And now we get into the the stat that caused the the, the people to throw figurative tomatoes at us. And, and quite frankly, I think at FinOpTex, they might have thrown real tomatoes if they had them available for some of those people. Uh, I remember, Kyle, the first time that I shared this data point with you, um, you looked at me like I had just gravely insulted your children. I mean, it was <laughs> visceral. And I suspect yeah. you got, got that same reaction from numerous people as you gave that information um, at FinOps X. So what, what was the data point? Well, across this entire study, it goes back to that one possible answer on the last question that said, oh, FinOps has already had a positive material effect on my company. You notice how broadly that's stated. It's any, it's like, have you had some, just even a little positive impact? It's not saying, you know, change the world. It's just, have you had a positive material impact? And one person, statistically 0% chose that answer. That was fascinating. So Kyle, is it that the expectations of success are too high and that's how they, they put that in their mind and that's how they projected onto this question? Or are people just discounting the small victories that they're getting or what? What's the, what would explain that? Yeah. First, let me let me let me just work through a little bit of my emotional wounds when I when you brought this up. Cause when you did say say that, I remember like I was just staring at you. We were in a team. <laughs> I'm just there. Say that again. One more time. Say it again. Is this real? Like, and uh, so, yeah, part of that was, you know, as somebody who's, you know, built FinOps teams that had very strong business mandate to have high impact and, and, you know, uh, the low hanging fruit of which, you know, even in the in FinOps X conference, everyone will talk about the low hanging fruit, you know, everyone's going to talk about here's how you discover idle instances and look how much that's saving you. Right. Um, so I was I, I was surprised in many ways um, about this. The one avenue that I can I that would have made sense to me, but it's kind of a, a, a more advanced thinking about this. So I'm trying to have empathy here for for the 499 here, um, which is uh, one of the problems we have in the FinOps space is it's really hard to get. Uh, uh, visualized accrued value, meaning when you when you save on opportunity cost, where does that show up, right? How does somebody say, oh, that's amazing. Our spend curve would have had us spending 50 million on, on this next year, but instead, because you did something early, now it's 45. But as that, that cost never hit the bottom line, right? So that five, that five million just evaporates, you know, success, success just evaporates there for you. So in some cases, um, I can see that, that that is a real dynamic, right? And, and teams, even my teams, we had our own form of how to make sure we were getting credit for that early, uh, you know, the, those early changes. So I think some of this, some of this, certainly not all of it points to just the complexity around when you do save something, how does that appear on generated value, right? Like recognize generated value in the business uh, rather than just like, well, somebody, uh, you know, not even recognizing that the curve has, has changed. And this is, Will and I talked a little bit about this in a, uh, during the conference. Uh, and the, the, the analogy that was coming to mind was firefighting versus forest management. And when you're in firefighting mode, that gets, I mean, that's what's on the news, right? The big, the big fires and look at these heroes going to do something. The forest management side, you never hear about, but what fires is it saving, right? And how do you get credit for that? Because I took care of these acres, you never heard about it, right? It, you just, it, it, it never appeared. And that is, a, that is a challenge, that's going to remain a challenging uh, part of the discourse in FinOps and I, and I hope it doesn't slow us, slow us down in that regard because it's, it, it is a bit of a sort of conceptual anchor on our, on our progress because there aren't strong patterns here. There's everybody's, you know, slugging their way through their own organizational chaos to try to get credit for the forest management side. And you guys are nailing it with the metaphors and analogies today. And I'll go to the next one because <laughs> Will has talked about this, this idea that in FinOps, an inch is actually a mile. Yeah. Why don't you talk about that a little bit in this context as 
analogy awards. Do we have a do we have a survey <laughs> at the end of this that we can Favorite analogy. Poll best? <laughs> It's all good. You know, the analogy seemed to work. I, I, yeah, I agree with everything Kyle just said. And it's mostly because Kyle and I have spoken about this a few times at this point and, uh, you know, spot on an inch is a mile. And so, you know, it, it's, it comes back to that technical debt concept we were talking about a minute ago, which is, you know, FinOps teams, when they start, have this really, really difficult challenge in front of them, which is, Okay, we're just now establishing this way of thinking today, but we maybe have been operating in the cloud for six to seven years. And to even get us to the starting line before the gun fires and, and like cost remediation, we have to go unravel a ton of debt. And we can't forget that the, the move to the public cloud was very quick. It was incentivized by the hyperscalers to go quick. COVID propelled it forward, innovation and competition propelled it forward. And when you, when you have such rapid adoption in such as an unknown you know, technology stack, what, what happens is that things aren't necessarily architected or thought through the right way because it's iterative and, and you learn. And so I, I come back to that inches a mile to go move, let's just give an example that's practical to, to take your tagging architecture and build what you need in your tags to align to cost uh, in your financial architecture, that's a pretty big undertaking. And then to even move that 5% towards, you know, fully remediated it takes a long time. And that's an inch, you know, but it takes a mile. And so I, I, I think there's a bit of that going on. And, you know, something I mentioned to Kyle and I'll mention here is that a lot of times FinOps practitioners and teams are not, their, not the best marketers, Right. And it's it's fun to have that hero construct of, hey, we put out this forest fire, we save some money. But then if those costs just crop back up a few days later, you know, ultimately the business is just going to start to go, okay, well, that's great, but like we still continually are having to send you out to firefight. And so I, there, there's something here to be said about setting the right expectations across the business. That's why we, you know, we believe in the CCOE construct, right? Having a community of different domains talking about cloud strategy. Uh, I think that's very important. And then, and then being able to market yourselves and, and your wins, even when they're not directly putting out a fire to Kyle's point. We, you know, I, this is an important place to say, everyone that we surveyed touches FinOps, right? It was a, it was a precursor and, and Paul, you can keep me honest here. It's, you know, when we started the questionnaire, we only brought in respondents that know about FinOps and touch it in some respect. So this isn't 499 people in HR saying it's not had a you know, material impact on my company. And I say that, you know, we all kind of laugh, but some of the pushback that we've heard and some of the almost emotional pushback we heard at FinOps uh, X was that can't be right. Who did you survey, right? There's no way. I mean, how, how, can, how can you say that, Cloud Bowl, right? Like a little bit of frustration in our direction. And the answer really is, this is a nuanced question by design. And I think that's what's so powerful about it. Positive material effect can mean anything to anyone. Um, the answer is, you know, for you as a leader, you as a practitioner who touches FinOps, have you seen that to date? It, it surprised me as well. And I think a lot of people maybe don't want to believe that it's a lot of work and it's gonna take a lot of marketing and there's gonna be a lot of cleanup that needs to happen before you get to that state of nirvana. So we get to that, I think we're at the point now where, okay, we've, we've, we've examined these data points. What do we do about it? So I think what I'd like to do now is move over to recommendations and kind of pivot over to Kyle and you and just let's cover these, um, these recommendations. What can companies who are participating in this today do today, start doing today that will make it a material impact going forward for them? Uh, and their practices. So is there anything you want to frame up before you go in, get into the recommendations or we just go there? I think we just go. Let's do it. Yeah, let's dig in. All right, so I mean, I think that the first one here is, you know, going back to, I mean, these first two are kind of wrapped up together, which is you have to empower your organization the right way and give them the tools. Um, and technology to support themselves the right way, right? And, and what I mean by that is 
four people cannot run FinOps for the entire company, or else you get into this place where you're constantly firefighting and you're you're working in the user request and constant battling of, of tasks that are being thrown your way. If you do not have uh, a solution available to everyone in the business that allows them to self-service their own cost and, and automate and look at their potential of savings and, and understand how they can manage their own cost, you're constantly going to be firefighting. And we believe that strongly at CloudBolt, not only because you know, we're obviously in that market, but because we've seen success happen with our customers that adopt our platform and give self-service to the masses. That, that's, that has to be where it starts. And it comes back to some of the stuff we saw in the survey, which is you have to have visibility at every level, not just the top and not just for those few people that are in the FinOps practice. So the, backbone, so the yeah. backbone is the technology or the platform that says you don't have to wait 24 to 36 months to, to get those wins and to, to start seeing material impact. I, I believe that strongly. And, and, it, and it, you know, it comes back to, we'll go back to that analogy about you know, managing your travel and expenses. If you're a business owner who has a cost center, you can see the expenses your team is contributing to the business, right? Mark, you have a team of six or seven here, you know what your team members are spending and you have the ability of approving and denying that. And you have tools and technology that help you do that at scale. That is still missing for most organizations in the world of FinOps. We can't talk about anomaly detection and forecasting and all that fun stuff until we get that right across the board. So that, that's the first one. I mean, the second one is, is interplay there, which is most FinOps leaders want to get out of the daily minutia of operational uh, task, right? And it's that firefighting versus, you know, protecting the forest construct that Kyle brought up earlier. Once you get the community of people in your business kind of managing those daily tasks on their own, then you start to get into the more strategic things where you can start to prevent the fires from happening. And Kyle, there's a lot of, of discussion that we had coming out of FinOpsX around automation and policy and things like that. I don't know if there's anything you want to add, but those strategic layers of thinking can only happen when you get out of the operational things and stop battling that. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. And um, I think this is probably the best point I was going to uh, weave in here. I think, you know, as I heard the sort of angst slides and a lot of how do we get engineers motivated in a lot of different language that were basically, you know, saying like, how do we shame people or, you know, pressurize people enough to get them to do things here. Um, <clears throat> and I think, I think that quagmire um, is, is indicative of still how early the FinOps practice is on how to get in a productized motion with the company. So you imagine all the people that are, all those engineers that you need to partner with to do things, they bring in their set of prioritized work and then they hear the, the FinOps pressure of like, this is critical, go change this, right? And they're like, but so is this. So who, how, how, what's the relative priority of these things? And so the first, the first hurdle is, can we even get engineers in the room to talk with us? Can we get them visibility to what they, you know, what we're seeing, et cetera, like, like you mentioned. And then once they're in the room, they're like, great, I, I recognize that we have spend and we want to do something, but how does that stack against all the other business priorities? And that's the second big hurdle that, that those teams run into. So my, my recommendation to, to get through that quagmire is, you have to think about this in a product mindset and bring product leaders with you in that room to say like, yeah, we're going to make all those tough trade-off decisions between optimizing this current capability and, and that value generated versus the value of extending this next capability, building this next product, et cetera, right? Like though, those are the real decisions that have to be made and it, and it frustrates engineers. A lot of our other data points is, is kind of the context of that frustration. Frustrates engineers when they're just told everything's important. All of that is important and it's all priority one, right? That's not the way the world works. So bring in that productized mindset into that will help you navigate that quagmire. Yep, I think that's a great way of capping off spreading accountability, right? Which is clearly we've talked about that in this presentation. Uh, 
spreading accountability is not just holding people accountable. It's bringing them into the conversation. I think Kyle, you kind of said that pretty eloquently. And then the final one is expecting evolution. We are in a place where we have learned a lot in the past five to six years in the world of FinOps. And it now has a, a term and it now has a community and an, a bunch of practitioners and it's clearly got a seat at the table. But I don't think anybody believes that this is a blueprint for success in a perfect way. It's not a copy paste. You can't just take these things and find success. There will be iterations of evolution. We may not even be at the fastest point of evolution, although it feels like we are sometimes. It could even speed up further from here. And so you know, we at CloudBull are very excited to be a part of that conversation and the community that's a part of that evolution. But you know, I would say, you know, we feel that this is going to change very rapidly and will continue to change. And that's just the nature uh, of operations and these, you know, these different domains. So very exciting times lay ahead, but you know, definitely don't, don't put your head in the sand because there's a lot happening very quickly. Absolutely. That's, that's a fast moving space. So with that, I think we've reached the, the end of our presentation and and recommendations on the data. I'd, I'd like to open it up for questions at this point. Um, you know, Elaine, do we have uh, any uh, items that were submitted? Um, and Kyle and Will, I think, also thinking back to FinOpsX and some of the questions you received there, or, you know, were there any ones that were particularly interesting or even amusing that, <laughs> that we could bring forward? Uh, well, I think one of, one of the uh, um, elements that was you know standing room only in the breakouts and people are very intrigued by is the focus initiative which to will's point on evolution and where we're at i think um i think what's what's appearing is that is kind of the gateway to the second wave of growth here because the finops ecosystem right now is very com uh complex fragmented spoke solution paths and there's only so much velocity you're going to get out of out of a you know a practice like like FinOps in a community as long as that remains true, right? There has to be a consolidation of of, of solution paths, um, and focus kind of gives us the opportunity to do that. And so, how that project goes over the next twelve months, I think will be very, very interesting to see how much momentum we can, because on the on the bright side, it could lift the ceiling of what's possible and and how much value we get out of this uh, ecosystem. But this is also a very difficult road uh, to travel and to try to get alignment around a spec and you know engagement from all the SaaS and and CSP uh, uh, vendors that that need to partner uh, with uh, other SaaS vendors such as ourselves to, to make this real. Well, did, did you have any questions come through on chat or? Nothing on the chat, but uh, that's okay. We'll give people a couple more minutes. I know we're kind of rounding out the hour. So if anything pops up, I'll, I'll throw it out there. But uh, Mark, it might be a good time to, to maybe ramp, ramp down. Yeah, let's do it. Um, well, with that, I think in summary, the, the way that FinOps has been so rapidly become so ubiquitous and prioritized and essential across uh, organizations is a testament to a lot of the work, great work that FinOps Foundation has done, that that community has done in, in pushing the, the, the practices forward. I mean, points to the fact of just how important getting your arms around cloud fin financial management is uh, now as, and as we go forward. But the reality is that challenges still exist. And the reality is Companies are thinking they have to wait two to three years and not seeing, and they're not admitting that they have seen material positive impact to date that, 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 that they may have wanted. And the reality is they don't have to wait. There, there are options based on the recommendations we talked about to move forward. Um, so that's great that they don't have to, to wait for that. So I wanna thank my panelists, especially Paul, Kyle and Will um, for the great discussion today. Uh, more importantly, I wanna thank our audience. Uh, I understand what it's like to, to carve out time in your day to make time for something like this. Thank you so much for being here with us, for paying attention, and uh, we hope it's been valuable to you and you can use this research to your advantage. Um, thank you all for being here and uh, have a great rest of your day or evening, wherever you are, and until next time, I'm with Thank you. <laughs>